thank you for attending. We're really excited to host this webinar with Promet Source. Um, and we have our lovely guest speakers, Michelle and Alan, who are going to talk to us today about uh, continuous integration, knowing it, uh, doing it, and doing this now. So we're really excited to have them. Just a little housekeeping before we begin. Um, make sure that if you're listening from your computer, select the mic and speaker audio option. Um, and you can wear a headset if you prefer, or you can listen live. Uh, we'll have you muted during the call, so whatever you're comfortable with is fine. Uh, we ask that if you're using any, if you're asking any questions, use the Q&A window. There's also a hashtag um, that we're going to be using, and I can let you know that in just a second. Um, and you can ask questions there. Uh, also, uh, there's a post-webinar survey uh, that'll show up, and we encourage you to uh, use that so we can better improve our webinars for our attendees. Now a little bit about the Drupal Association. The Drupal Association's mission is to foster and support the Drupal community so they can collaborate together as they innovate the project. There's so many ways that we can help the community together. We host Drupal.org and we're building a tech team to improve the site. We provide grants for community members to fund ways that grow smaller communities and further the project, like starting new camps in new areas. <laughs> We also host DrupalCons, we just had one in Austin, which brings thousands together to work on the project and bond as a community. We also provide scholarships to help amazing community members from around the globe attend the event. And all of this is funded through our memberships and our DrupalCons and our partners. Coming up, we have our DrupalCon in Amsterdam. Uh, that's going to be in September. We also have our Global Training Days program. This is a um, program for training companies to, or community members to host uh, low cost or free training for Intro to Drupal members. And um, it's a really exciting program to get people involved in your community and learn about Drupal. And then we also have an, another webinar coming up next week, June 24th, Metal Tool presents Securing Drupal and the Tools to Test It. And we just want to take a moment to thank Promet Source and other supporting partners during our program. Um, they're really a, a wonderful asset to the community and, and helps the Drupal Association put on things uh, such as our DrupalCon and, and supporting our programs that we're doing right now. So without further ado, I'm going to switch it over to Michelle and Alan from Promet Source. Again, if you have any questions, please uh, let me know in the Q&A and I'll switch over and ask those questions. So everyone, um, thanks for joining us. Uh, this is Promet Source. Uh, today we're talking about Drupal and continuous integration. And the message today is do it yourself, do it now, for real. You might have heard of this before, you might have heard of continuous integration, but we want everybody to have a takeaway here. Um, wherever you are in the spectrum, whether you're just getting started, you're just learning about it, uh, we hope that there's something, whether you're a project manager, a, a product owner, a developer, there's something here that you can take away um, and start doing continuous integration now. In this presentation, we're going to go over what CI, continuous integration, means to Promet, and that has been something that has evolved over the years. We'll talk about why it is important, why this is something that people talk about. And then Alan, my co-presenter here, uh, will go over his 10 principles of CI. And finally, we will um, dare to do a live demo. But first, um, we would like to little, know a little bit more about you, why Alan and myself are tittering on um, introducing ourselves. If you could go find the chat um, over on your, um, on your webinar and tell Lauren why you're here. So um, maybe you're here because you heard CI, you kind of have this vague sense that it's important, you want to know a little bit more about it. Uh, maybe you're already sold on it and you feel really overwhelmed and you're just looking for a starting point. 
or maybe you already are rocking CI and you just wanted to come and get some affirmation about how much better you're doing it than us. And we would love to hear from you too. Please um, let us know what you're doing, um, all the awesome stuff. We'd love to, um, you know, to give you a shout out um, and to clue people in on other things that other people are doing. There's certainly many ways to do CI. Um, or maybe you're just here, uh, you have no idea, someone made you come here, you were trying to make it look like you were doing work today, um, and you're gonna take a nap. You're welcome. So while you're finding a chat and telling Lauren why you're here, um, Alan and I will introduce ourselves. My co-presenter is the great Alan. Um, Alan Chapel is a um, Drupal Solutions Architect here at Promet Source. He is the maintainer of Views Natural Sort. He has built modules to help um, migrate into Civi CRM. Um, he's done a ton of work with Civi CRM. A lot of a huge background um, in automated testing. He worked at all players previously before coming to Promet um, and has brought on a lot of knowledge about automated testing, PHP unit. You can tweet at him at um, General Redneck, his blog down there, generalredneck.com. He's all over Texas. Um, definitely check him out. Alan, are you there? I'll introduce myself, Alan. I, on the other hand, less interesting, Michelle Krejci. I'm a developer. Uh, I'm a Comungeon here at um, the Chicago base office here in Promet, at Promet Source. You can find me on um, Drupal.org or um, tweet at me at DevMishev. I have done a lot of work with uh, continuous integration, um, mostly because of my curmungeonness and wanting to make things work better. We also need to give a shout out to our dear friend, um, Will Milton, who's not joining us today, but he's a solutions architect, a guru, a wizard here um, at, um, at Promet Source. The best way to find out more about him is by looking at his GitHub account. We'll talk about Vagrant, we'll talk about Chef, um, even some packagist composer things. Um, and Will Milton has really spearheaded it all. He's doing some very cool things in the Drupal community. So, Lauren. <laughs> Um, so it looks like we have a couple, uh, we have a mix. We have a couple people that um, are just getting started and really wanted to kind of get an idea of, uh, you know, what what is this and how do I do it? And then also um, some people that have a little uh, difficulty with CI and just uh, kind of want to hear a little bit more from the pros on how it can make their life more exciting and productive um, for their for their work life. So um, it looks it looks a little bit mixed as we suspect. No, no smug, no, no smug. No, um, no. Oh, no. That's, that's too bad. Um, well, that's great. I, I, I hope then that um, our webinar today can be both too technical and not technical enough and just find a way to disappoint everybody. Um, we'll, we'll look for that sweet spot. Once again, if you have any questions, um, you can tweet at us. Um, you, can, you can also talk to Lauren. You know how to find her now. Um, but you can uh, also sh shoot us a, a question um, at this has hashtag. Uh, we'll also we'll, we'll answer some questions at the end of the webinar. But um, we'll, Alan and I will, can take questions um, at this hashtag uh, through the rest of the week, really. All right. Finally, back to that continuous integration stuff. So if you've heard about continuous integration before and you feel like this is important, you probably heard it in terms of Selenium maybe. Uh, Selenium was uh, so somehow just came into the zeitgeist a couple years ago. Everyone was talking about Selenium or maybe you've heard of Jenkins. Um, certainly this was the way that I first heard about it. Um, I had this sort of vague sense that continuous integration was Selenium, Jenkins, making stuff go, magic happened, wasn't quite sure. My, my very first thing that I needed to do when I came to Promat, my very first task was figure out how to test. This was two years ago. So I really started um, collecting the toys that are involved in continuous integration. I set up a Jenkins server. I ran a bunch of Selenium tests. I, I felt that 
CI to me was a collection of all these really sweet tools that are out there. Um, and that was a terrible approach. That was that was the wrong way to do it. Um, and I even did presentations about it where I went over all of the tools that you could use for CI. But in fact, what I learned is that CI is a process and it is a co commitment to improving, which I hope that I can um, expand upon a little bit more. But it didn't make any difference if I had all of these tests running if I couldn't make it mean anything. So essentially what was happening is my Selenium tests were failing all the time and some of that had to do with how poor the tests were and I will own that. But also if, if something is failing and you cannot say with any assurance why it failed. You can't roll it back to anything meaningful. Um, you, you can't assure that it won't ever happen again. Uh, you can't do regression tests on it. Then it doesn't mean anything to say that something doesn't look right. I wasn't the only one who has come across this. I've met a lot of people at different camps um, and DrupalCon who Got, got maybe 30% there with CI by implementing some tools, but found that they were meaningless, they added more work, they were tedious. So I have totally changed my tune. Um, what, when I started thinking about the problem we are actually trying to solve, the problem we're all trying to solve is we don't want to roll a big messy project onto the server and then test this shit which is essentially the mentality that we were in. So we would develop, we would add some configuration, we'd have some stuff in the database, we'd have some stuff in code, we'd have all, all sorts of bits of code that would come together and we'd roll around Katamari style, putting this project together and we'd roll this big ball of stuff onto the server and just expect QA to tell me if this is okay to put on a production server somewhere. This is the problem we we're wanting to solve. Just collecting a big ball of stuff. So when I started to realize that continuous integration was not primarily about cool toys, and I started thinking about it in terms of a process, we formed a definition of continuous integration for us. So here at Promet Source, what continuous integration has come to mean is just finding opportunities to inject small bits of quality insurance into our development process at every stage. So rather than thinking about an, an enormous process all at once and how are we going to have all this automation and we're going to deploy and build, um, those pieces came later, but when we just found small opportunities to start doing things, that's when we really started to cook. So I could Google this for you. I could Google continuous integration for you. If you Googled it yourself, you would um, maybe come across this wiki, wiki page. This is from the continuous delivery uh, wiki. Um, and, and you see a, a, a process here where you have your, your development team and they're using version control. If you don't have version control, that's the first thing you're going to do today. That's your takeaway. Go home, get Git. Um, put all of your projects under version control. Um, once you have things under version control, then you can start to work on building um, and locking down your build. We'll talk about how we've locked down our build um, and our deployment. Once you have that, then you can start adding acceptance tests, then you can start adding user acceptance tests, and then you can have automated um, releases. So we'll talk about how we've done that and, um, yes, the cool tools that we've used to do that as well. So knowing that this is how we have improved ourselves, I think I can start going in and showing you what to do. Alan. There we go, finally. <laughs> I've been trying to unmute myself for like, I knew that you wanted to talk this entire time, but you didn't have to sabotage me. <laughs> you got to introduce yourself. You got to be – I'm turned out to be the curmudgeon here, you know, and that's the way you're introducing yourself. But no, 
No, no, I, I, I'm going to have my part of this conversation here, and I'm going to let these people know exactly what CI is. You kind of went over it in, in, in not quite the detail that I think that they need to be able to to execute on this. So I've come up with some principles, and, and you said at the first of this you were going to go over my principles, but no, you were going to go into your demo instead. Let, let's go over my principles right quick. All right. All right, we have 10 of them. What is continuous integration? Uh, we do have what she was talking about, revision control. That is your number one. Build automation, automate deployment, self-testing, build, and so on and so forth. I'll go through each of these in detail to give you an idea of what you will be doing at each of these steps. And starting from the top to the bottom of this list is what you will need in kind of an order uh, of importance. So starting at the top of the list, you must have revision control to make continuous integration work. Also remember, you can use the show, uh, show uh, the answers and questions window there on your right hand side or you can tweet your questions. We're, we're sent here monitoring the, the hashtag so that uh, in case you want to get yourself out there a little bit more publicly, you can. All right, let's start with revision control. So revision control is basically your typical Git, your typical SVN, uh, CVS, if you must, but please get in revision control. Your code must be in version control so that you can start continuous integration. Otherwise, you're trying to integrate using something of a method of swapping files with each other. Integration means multiple developers working together. So how else can they integrate their code unless there's a way to manage changes? Revision control does that for you, and it's the base of what revision, uh, of what continuous integration is, is based around. Then we have the next step, build automation. A single command should have the capability of building a system. So what Michelle is going to show you here in a little bit is actually how we do this. Um, you know, this sounds intimidating. But it's true. So usually what happens is you or, or some of your developers will build a system that will essentially build from a bash script. So all they have to do is type in the name of the command, and then you have a site starting to build. Sometimes it's a series of bash scripts, but what you want to do is, is get that down where you don't have a manual process. And that way, people can develop faster, and they can build it from a fresh checkout. That allows you to continuously integrate faster as well, which kind of goes down to automated deployment. Once you're able to build your system, why not deploy it in an automated way? Deploying it in an automated way allows you to, one, just build an environment on a trigger. Let's say like uh, GitHub. GitHub has the ability to hit up an API whenever you make a pull request. So with that said, then you could then you could have it build on that on that trigger. It would be automated, so it's much faster than a manual process. That, how you have you ever had it where the project manager is always sitting there nagging you about Okay, can you build dev, dev for me? Can you build dev for me? Can you build dev for me? And this happens like multiple times during the day because you have the updated code. They want to see that. Now, if it was automated, you wouldn't have to take that time out of your routine to go and build dev for your PM. It also gives you it's less mistakes because it's the same process over and over. There's no human, er human interaction or error. And it usually provides an automated contingency uh, plan. So like whenever you're deploying to live, you have yourself a plan to roll back. So you, you build that into your script. Then you can just, it says, oh, I, I failed. Let, let's, let's restore the database and everything. And, and this happens without you having to do 
at interaction. Jenkins is a really good CI server out there. There's a couple others that we that I've heard about here recently, like Go was a great one at uh, at DrupalCon that we got to hear about from uh, Rob Ristroff. And there's also Travis CI, which is one we use in particular, and I'm pretty sure that Michelle's going to tell you about. Next, we would have self-testing build. So Travis CI and the like, they, auto, they allow you to automate your builds. In the build process, you can also take advantage of that time to test your build. So what that means is, and so we're, we're building upon our original concept. We had our revision control. Using our vision control, we can store tests now, right? And using our, our, um, our uh, automated deployment and automated build, we can now run tests during that time using PHP unit. This will confirm the behavior of our build at that particular time. And so what this allows you to do is to have some insurance that, hey, everything's okay is a peace of mind. Now, that's not, it, it kind of depends on the quality of test you write, which Michelle also talked about just a moment ago. But at the same time, some test is better than no test. You have that green or red light letting you know on every build that, hey, I'm good, or no, we, we, we can't accept this pull request. It's better than code review. So what's better than self-testing your build? Well, let's minimize what's happening, uh, the differences between production and our testing environment, or in this case, maybe even our local development environment. So this is kind of where Chef and what we use VirtualBox, our virtual machines, come in, come in handy. Because environmental changes can lead to our failures. Um, for instance, one here recently I found out is Civi CRM does not run on anything lower than PHP 5.3. Well, I mean, we all should be up to the latest version of PHP. Yeah, I know. But there's still some servers out there running Ubuntu 10.10, .10, which only get uh, 5.2, you know? Um, there, so if you don't have a machine or an environment that is running that particular operating system, then how do you know whenever you deploy that it's not going to blow up? So test in a clone of production. I mean, you can make a scalable version. You don't have to... You don't have to uh, have it to where it's exactly the same, but test them in a uh, in a clone production. So another thing you would like to do, I I threw Michelle off here. <laughs> another thing you'd like to do is frequent commits. Okay, you want to commit often. Commit make frequent commit commits make the de makes debugging easier. It gives you a better history of what's going on. Um, I don't know if any of you are developers out there, but the glory of of uh, Git bisect is phenomenal. If you don't have frequent commits, however, that makes it a lot harder for you to to do said uh, you know uh, Git bisect because. With, uh, with bigger commits, your problem is in a bigger area. You can't narrow it down. So it makes it easier to merge, move, add, and make changes. And makes code consolidation easier. Alan, can I ask a question really quickly? Yeah, go for it. Great. Um, I have two. Why are you using Chef instead of Puppet or Ansible? Okay. So okay. that's a good question as far as, you know, there's different flavors, many different ways to do things. Puppet is definitely a great uh, server management system. Chef happens to be what we do a user group at there in uh, there in uh, Chicago, and what our uh, generally what our team knows how to use. Puppet definitely can be used, and also Chef was supported by Vagrant before before Puppet was. So 
that was another reason we use Vagrant. Um, Michelle, if you have anything to add to that, go for it. Right. Yeah, we wanted to use Vagrant, which we'll go over in, um, momentarily, to build locally with the, sa the same way that we were configuring our um, production servers. So we, we do our we provide our own hosting and we use Chef to configure our production servers and can use those same cookbooks to configure our local environment. Um, and you're right, Vagrant was, it's supported by Puppet now as well. Um, but the other, the other thing I want to say about Chef, um, and I, I don't have enough experience with, prompt, with um, Puppet to, to make up anything but the, the scuttlebutt opinion, but I really love writing um, uh, cookbooks in Chef. It's Ruby based. Um, I find it a lot of fun to um, put my configuration management in code. Um, I found it really easy to pick up. I, I was able to get started with it really quickly. I, I think a main theme though that we that we have is you should do what everyone will adopt. So if everyone feels excited about Puppet, if that's what people enjoy doing, go go for it. We, we found that Chef was what everyone got excited about here. Chef was, um, you know, Chef solved the problems that we, that we had, but I, I, I wouldn't necessarily recommend one or the other. And with that said, I've actually written Puppet, uh, uh, I forget what they call them there, because it's been so long to go. Um, I, writ, I wrote uh, Manifest, I think is what they're called, but uh, for Puppet in, um, when I was working at allplayers.com, and it, it, you know, it has a lot of the same functionality, and it's written actually really similar, similar, uh, similarly. So it, you know, they, they're both very powerful. They just, they're just a little bit different flavor, in my opinion, for what that's worth. <laughs> Disclaimer here. Great. All thank right. You. No problem. Is there another one you said you had two? Um, I think you answered the question. Okay, gotcha. So. With, with frequent commits comes co-consolidation. So what that means is, is everybody should be on the same page. Um, I, you know, this is controversial, and I'll, and I'll admit that. But the idea of everybody, you know, refactor, not refactors their code, rebases their code once a day would mean that they have all the newest changes for that day, even if that code breaks something that they're currently working on. Now, with that said, I know that you want to move forward, but what, what that does is that forces a problem to be fixed and a problem to be, you know, to, for people to be aware of problems. And therefore, you also have less problems merging code whenever someone fixes the break because at the point that everybody brought stuff in then everybody also has all your changes and then you're 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 able to um, you're able to see exactly where, where people's been making changes so you you should expect that stuff to be broken on development once a day. Additionally, you get to run tests whenever you rebase at that once a day mark. And then you know what's broken ahead of time. Yes, you'll know, okay, well that, if you can justify that this is broken because uh, so and so's not done with their feature, that's cool. You've justified the test uh, failing. But at the same time, what of the ones that you didn't know were going to fail? Oh, -ho, that helps you out. You know, it's like a, it's a, it's a it's an insurance and it helps you know faster and we're all about going fast so you might want to also have fast builds now at, whenever I was working at all players we had tests that run on selenium selenium isn't always known to be the fastest in the world so we had this suite of tests and it's a software as a service that would run for an hour Okay, during what we would call our code freeze, we'd have the problem of everybody's trying to get their last commits in before 2 p.m. on Friday, because that was our code freeze. That's when we couldn't commit any more changes to, to the release branch 
that's where we're that's where we're stopping bug fixes from there on out for that release. All right, everybody's trying to get their changes in. All right, we have automated we have an automated uh, build set up. So every five minutes or so, this thing is spinning up another environment and it's trying to run that one hour test. So it wasn't fast. It was actually clogging up our workflow because we had to wait for the test to be finished to be able to go and 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 see what those you know to see how that particular build would fare. So the concept of fast builds is important there. At that point, you need to say, okay, there's a new build. Let let's go ahead and either abort the tests because we want, you know, we'll probably get this on this new one, or we need to make it to where we can build multiple ones simultaneously. In addition, it's helpful to get your tests running as efficiently as possible. And and a good alternative to, to Selenium would actually be, and I'll talk about build availability here in a second, would be to use something like PhantomJS unless you specifically need the ability to test browser, you know, per browser, you know, and, and see the differences. Um, Phantom JS is WebKit based and it is extremely fast. And Michelle can attest to this. She she'll she'll show you as we use it on uh, Travis CI. Build availability. Make it where your build is available to everyone. Okay let people in okay so this means like I, I, I'm not saying like okay I got this top secret project let the world see it no let your clients see it let your PM see it let your developers see it so at this point you can you can see any build that's ever been made and be able to make them on on the fly this gives people trust in what you're doing so they can see it working at any point also, with that said, make your test results available. So this provides kind of a warranty. Um, when we get to talking about uh, behavioral driven development, um, which Michelle's done a little bit of the hat. No, I say a little bit, she's done a lot. You can actually use your test cases, your use cases, as, a, uh, as requirements and as a insurance for the project. So in this case, if each of those requirements that you built into the hat test cases do not show up as green, well then you have something wrong that you need to fix. But it also shows if you can keep those green, you have a warranty saying, okay, these have all passed the functionality that you have asked for is being delivered to you now. You can also find your find your problems earlier. Um, so what we used to do at at uh, all players and what we've wanted to do at Promat um, is actually send out the test results to everybody. So at this point, our project is done. Are you know is done building, and now we have a list of test results. In fact, it kind of happens during our code review as it is with Travis CI because we get the little green checkbox or or the or the red X that says, "Hey, you know, I'm a I'm broken or I'm fixed," and that's pretty much where we want where we that's your ten properties of uh, of a uh, continuous integration. That's that's where you want to be. You don't have to be at the through the entire list, but try to keep those in in mind in that order because that is like your ultimate goal, the holy grail. Right, and like we want. Um, yeah, I'm I'm going to show you a, a little bit about what we do. Um, please know that it's been a evolving process. So I had said earlier that I had started with Selenium and Jenkins and I was testing um, sites that were about to go live. Um, and that wasn't working because we had just katamari a big ball of 
Drupal configuration stuff. Um, and something that, that um, Alan, you didn't mention was getting your, being completely database independent. We, getting ourselves database independent, um, which means that we build from scratch as, you know, as much as possible, as often as possible, which means putting configuration in code. If you're not doing that, that's your step. You have to, you absolutely have to put your configuration in code. Um, that was our first thing, so that we could take the ball apart and put it back together over and over and over and over again, um, so that we didn't have a giant ball that was not replicable. Um, so, so what, what do we do? Well, we we use Chef, like we said, Chef, Puppet. Um, these are configuration uh, management tools. So we use Chef to lock down how each of us were building locally in a way that matched production. Um, we use Chef in in um, oh, and this is our Chef cookbook here. You can check it out um, on on GitHub. How how we spin up um, virtual environments using this Drupal cookbook. Uh, we, but we use Chef to configure our production servers using a Drupal cookbook and then use Vagrant. Uh, Vagrant Up is the, um, um, the docs online. We use Vagrant to configure virtual boxes. So now our projects include a way to build with a single command um, a local environment that replicates how production was made. And finally... So with, that, um, with that said, you know, we have the first four of my principles already covered, you know, that, and that's a great place to be, if you can just get that far. Right. And then we, we recently, maybe about four months ago, because we have a reliable build and we can we can build that big ball of Drupal over and over and over again and have that replication and that assurance. And I can check out a git commit and build it the exact same way that it looked when that git commit was made. When we have that sort of ability to go back and forward and rebuild and build and replicate our process, then we can really do testing because we know what we're testing now. When a BHAT test fails, and this is what a BHAT test looks like, when a BHAT test fails, um, I know I can say exactly why it failed, and I can roll back. So enough teasing about a demo. Let me actually show you what we do here. All right, this is what it might look like. I'm, I'm inside a, um, a, a demo here, a, a demo project, and this is what our root looks like. I'm not going to go over everything um, inside our root. You see that we have Composer. I had alluded earlier to um, to using Packagist. So this is something that Will Milton has done. He has put almost, soon he will have all of Drupal 7 modules um, and, and Drupal 7 core on Packagist. Packagist makes um, projects available through Composer so that we can have um, a Composer file uh, that includes all of the requirements for our projects is very Drupal 8 e um, All of the modules that we would need to build this project so that our Git root, our, our, our root project does not include Drupal core or Drupal um, contrib modules. It just um, includes requirements for them with, with Composer, which is Michelle. very cool. It makes for a very so, lightweight site. Really quick, can, can we get the uh, recipe URL again? Oh, we'll have, we'll have it at the end. I'll have, you know, while okay. we're answering questions, we will we will keep all of the links. But um, it, it's GitHub slash Promet slash um, Drupal underscore cookbook. Great. Go I ahead. got a question for you. Why not Drush make? Ah, I'm going to... So in, instead, instead of Composer, why not use Drush make? Well, um, since this is going to be publicly made available, I don't want to slam... <laughs> <laughs> um, Drush Make, but Drush Make um, is, as anyone who has worked with Drush Make knows, unreliable, slow. Uh, it, it does a really good job at archiving what your project looks like, keeping track of package of um, patches, that sort of thing. But in terms of reliably building your site for you and managing your dependencies and making sure that you know a Drupal contrib module has all of its dependencies before it runs. Um, I wouldn't do it. <laughs> so with that said, Composer is the way Drupal 8 is going. And 
just I mean, just make has done some incredible work at at emulating some of the capability that Composer does already have. Um, and I, you know, it's fair to say that Dress Make was probably around before Composer, actually. But Composer does it so much better. Yeah, I really think that it's a it's a great way to uh, the great way to manage your your requirements, and you can run just about any script you want to, just like you're running on the shell. Absolutely. Yeah. Props to Will Milton, Windmill Will, uh, for putting. Drupal up on packages so that we can use Composer in Drupal 7. Uh, that's very cool. So this is this is our Vagrant file. You should know that this is many, many, many iterations of a Vagrant file. We used to run bash scripts within the Vagrant file. Um, Vagrant can run a bash script to configure your environment. Um, now we have pre-provisioned boxes. This happens to be an Oracle flavor of um, Linux because this particular site is going to run on an Oracle flavor of Linux. Um, and it, it can run just shell scripts, um, and there's quite a number of bash scripts that are being run here. Um, it's not important that you use Vagrant the same way that we use Vagrant. What's important to know is that this single file, this Vim, this Vagrant file, excuse me, um, that's in the middle of our Drupal project, this Vagrant file alone um, allows me to run Vagrant up um, and provision my local environment with a virtual box in the exact same way that everyone else is. So I've actually already done that. Go ahead. So notice that she checked this out and the Vagrant file was already there. So she runs Vagrant up now, Vagrant up, builds her machine, and then now she has a working environment that's just like every other developer's. That's just like our, our uh, staging that's just like production. Right. So by Vagrant SSHing into my environment, I can um, navigate to uh, my, my, root pro my root project, um, and our project is in dub, 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 and I can bootstrap it. Um, I should be able to bootstrap it, but I can't. Errors. Um, I, can, I can use it um, in the same way that um, everyone else is using it. Forgot that I'm using an Oracle flavor. Um, all right, so just bootstrapped it. Enough about Vagrant. So that single file. If you if you already have version control down, if you're already putting all of your configurations and features, if you're not already putting all of your configuration and features, if all of your configurations are not exported yet, that is the first place to start. Make sure that your site builds with update hooks and features. You are not database dependent. Um, if you're if you're not there yet, you can stomp around. That's your takeaway. Make sure everybody is using um, features, update hooks. If you are there, I would highly recommend using Vagrant. Um, you don't necessarily have to use Chef. You, you can configure an environment with Bash. There's already Vagrant boxes available to you. Go read um, VagrantUp.com. Uh, you can look at how your developers can start repeating their process over and over again. Once you have that, we use um, we use a build script, and it's just it's just Bash. We've experimented with other things. We've used Ant. We played with Thing for a while. Thing is just um, PHP Ant. So um, <laughs> all the problems with Ant plus all the problems with PHP. But we just decided to use Bash. Bash is simple. All the developers understand it. It's just command line language. You see here that I'm passing all of my arguments here to Drush, but I'm just running a bunch of Drush commands. Um, and you, you might think, why, um, why is this important? You're running a bunch of Drush commands. Why have a script for it? Because this is the order that you need to run the Drush commands in order to build this site reliably over and over and over again. And I want to know um, if, if Alan makes a change to this project, if he adds something that I need to do, um, if I need to, um, in, to um, drush SQLC a table or drop a table, um, if I need to run another script, I have a script here that just adds taxonomy terms. I want to add it to the project, and Alan doesn't have to worry about it. We don't have to have this oral history between the two of us where I have to ping him and, oh, I forgot to tell you, or I'm not keeping some readme file that you have to read every time you want to build your site. Nope, you just run the same script over and over and over again, and it builds the site. So if you don't have that, um, 
get going with your build automation. Make sure that you can build your site in a single command. So I built I built this site with that command um, build drush build dot sh, um, and it looks something like this after um, after I build it. And I I can be assured that if um, Alan was was to pull down That's this beautiful. site. <laughs> if Ellen was to pull down this site and he was to run Vagrant up, that he would get this exact same thing. And once you know that Ellen will have the same thing that I have, then we know that I could create that environment over and over and over again, so that's when I can start using Travis. So I've, I've, we're, used, we're using Travis um, to catch our, our commits um, and build the site. So our, our Travis file um, looks like this, <laughs> which looks more complicated than it actually is. What this is, what this is essentially doing is repeating the, the build process um, in, you know, so that Travis can build the site the same way that Alan and I would build the site. So it, it can't use Vagrant. Actually, I think Travis can run in Vagrant, excuse me. Um, but it it, it can spin up the site yeah. on a git commit, um, and and if I were to add my changes to the Vagrant file, Michelle, I have a question. When you're ready, go ahead. Yeah. Um, why rebuild the database in CI when actual deployment is going to involve modifying an existing production database? Okay, that's great. So. I think what, what's being asked here is um, what what happens when you have an existing production site, right? Let's say I worked on the New York Times. The New York Times has content. They are not going to rebuild their site over and over and over again. So they have legacy they have legacy content. They're using Drupal for what it should be. It's a content management system. It was meant to have content in the database. So at that point, it's already in production. And we, we call it production at the point that clients start entering their own content. There's a number of ways to do it. Um, this is where features becomes really important and deploying features and update hooks. But the, the production database becomes an, archive, an, an archival um, uh, fragment of the build. So I need a snapshot of production in my build now. So we would transition this process, this vegan process with bash scripts to being what we would call database um, dependent, or it has a, um, a reference database. So every, every developer would need to develop on a snapshot of production. For us, that snapshot of the production database happens right after our last release. So as soon as we, we um, release our tag onto um, production, we take a, a, a database dump of the production um, the production database, and we all start developing against that database. So instead of, you know, where I had started from scratch, I dropped my database, and um, I installed, I run Drush C, um, SI here, site install. Instead of doing that, it would install the production database and then run my commands. Okay. So with, um, that, with that said, also, uh, we would also, it, it helps for people who do support because they can actually grab a a, a uh, reference database from live at any point and just throw it in there and then have the build happen as well. Um, this will, you know, this will give us a look to see, you know, exactly how uh, our next like update process is going to happen, like our next release. It allows us to emulate that so that we can actually test what releasing is going to be like before it actually happens. So I have a couple follow-up questions from that, if you have a minute. Um, do you manage any aspect of the update process in site-specific modules update hooks? Can you, Lauren, can you repeat that again, site-specific module update hooks? Correct. Do you manage any of the aspects of the update process? Yeah, I think I got this one. Um, okay. So basically what's happening here is they're asking, are we using update hooks to update our configurations and you know specific portions of the site, and the answer is yes. Um, we use features primarily for things that are configurable and things that behave nicely in features. 
Um, there are some things, like, especially whenever you're talking about, like, Civi CRM installs um, or, let's say, some panels work or um, some configurations that must be done in an update hook. If, with that said, it's easy to do. You do an update. You take your reference database or your brand, because that's the only time you would need to do an update hook is when you're working off of a production site. So you get your reference database, you put your, you build your update hooks, and then you run your build again. If you notice within uh, the build script, there's going to be a drush db up in our build script. That's going to update the date. That's going to update the um, the current snapshot we have with all the updates of any module that happens to be installed. So, for instance, if we upgrade the version of rules and it has update hooks, those are going to be run as well. So that's kind of a catch-all for us, and that's how we do that process. <laughs> I, I was going to just show um, briefly what a BHAT test looks like, um, but if, you know, if someone has interest in that, you know, they can they can let me know. These are all of the, the, the resources here um, for, for everything that we've shown you. It may be missing Travis CI stuff. Um, but, it, but Lauren, do you get the sense that we should open it up for questions? It might be a better way to use this time. Um, I think that we, we're fine for right now. Just continue and then we'll save some for the end. Okay, all right. And I will um, go back to the to my, my build here. Um, so what I've shown, shown so far um, is what we've done with Vagrant to um, configure a local environment virtually so that every developer can replicate the process over and over again. Uh, once we have that, we have a script that makes it explicit how you build the site and the steps involved. That could include a reference database um, and, and developing up against a, um, a reference database. Um, and then once we have this, this build that we can rely on, we know that we can build it on Travis. Um, and we can just make sure that we can have a really naive Travis that just sees if things build. Um, you know, if, if the build fails, then it'll fail on, um, on production. So that's a, a valid test. Um, but you could start injecting uh, VHAT tests in at that point. So we have quite a lot of, um, of VHAT tests. I, I started to um, uh, I, I've, I've started to uh, now that I've spent several months working on BHAT, my ideas about BHAT have changed quite a bit. This isn't a, a BHAT presentation, so I won't go too much into it. But um, if you're if you're wondering how do I start with BHAT, we honestly shifted our weight about it for many months. We talked about doing it a lot more than we actually did it. Um, there is a Drupal ex extension. There's a there's a Drupal class um, for BHAT that allows you to do some basic things, um, bootstrapping Drupal. Uh, we we do have that link. That's the um, a Drupal extension. I definitely recommend checking that out. Um, again, we we're using Composer to manage our dependencies. Um, if I recommend having a composer file just to go and get um, BHAT and the BHAT Drupal extension. Um, that's how we how we get it onto each of our local builds. Once you have that, um, just keeping a suite of tests th that can be pretty simple. Um, we these tests are are very naive. Um, they just make sure that all the links that you want to see are on the home page. I felt really silly writing this test when I um, initially wrote it. I actually wrote this test to give to another developer um, a, a, as an assignment, right? I'm just creating a ticket in Redmine, um, and instead of saying, hey, give me a menu, give me these links, give me, um, you know, make sure I can navigate to each of these pages, it was really great that I could just write a test that says, hey, develop until this test pass. Um, and this is the kind of ticket that developers want to get. We don't want a ticket that says, give me a content type, then create a view and a menu link to it. We would rather have, or at least I would rather have, um, the kind of um, 
requirement that was made explicit here so that I could define done and know when it was done and ensure that it stayed done. And that's the biggest problem with Drupal is, is regression testing, making sure things stay done. And I wanted to highlight this in particular because um, this is fairly benign. Uh, this just goes and makes sure that like social links are there, right? Um, and in fact, this test was breaking the other day uh, from after something I had done that I thought was completely unrelated. And it turned out that I had inadvertently messed up some of the permissions here. Um, so this, this caught me um, in a totally unrelated task from breaking something that I probably wouldn't have known was broken until several weeks later. So um, using BHAT to before any development gets done, defining that task. So giving this, giving a test like this to a user, having them develop against this test, and they can close it out and say that it's done, and knowing that um, these tests are running over and over again on Travis before anyone can commit anything uh, has really changed our process. So we were finding that the last 20% of any um, project took 80% of the time. So we would we would fly through a project, we'd get really close to done, and it just felt like we were doing and redoing our work over and over and over again because <laughs> work kept breaking work that we thought was done. These tests has helped us define done, helped us make sure that things stay done. Um, this was a really e this was a that was a pretty pretty um, easy example. We have quite quite more um, complicated examples, um, examples that relate to um, uh, relate to uh, commerce. What we found is the, the best way to do things um, is to really write tests that are very explicit. Um, so instead of using the Drupal extension, which is a good way to start, you can extend the Drupal um, extension for BHAT and start writing your own your own tests, um, and they can get pretty uh, complicated. I won't go through too too many of them here, but um, for for instance, um, I wrote a a, a test here um, that it, it looks really simple. I could have a, a line like, given that I am on a article type node with the title test. What, what that would do is it would go to that page. We use PhantomJS to, to handle the JavaScript. It would go to that page, but it would know, it, it would be able to find that page um, by doing an entity field query to find the last time that I created a node of that type um, with that title. It would return that node ID so I could make sure that when I told BHAT I wanted to go to a node type with that title, I would indeed be able to go to that type. Again, this isn't a BHAT demonstration, so I don't want to <laughs> get too bogged down in BHAT. But I, if you if you are in the process of, you know, you, you feel like the time is right, you've got some some build locked down, um, you feel that you can start injecting some tests. Again, Drupal, um, the Drupal extension for BHAT is a good place to start. But then you might find that tests are more useful when um, you're really getting into the guts of Drupal. And I loved BHAT when we first started doing it because I was able to really really get inside Drupal really early on, really think about what it means for this thing to be done, how can I prove that it's done, um, and it, it's really made me a better developer, it's made made better code for me, and it's helped the client understand what I'm doing, and, um, and you communicate with the client a lot better. So to reiterate what we said earlier, CI is a way to interject little bits of QA in your process. That way you know that stuff that you do gets done, stays done, and everyone knows that it's done. Take a look at the resources. We got them right up here. Um, make sure that you pick them up. See, we have everything from the Drupal cookbook that we use always that uh, I believe uh, Will uh, Milton did most of the work on that. All the way down to our uh, resources for Bahat and Phantom JS. Check it out. See what you can do with it. And on that note, Lauren, do we do we have any questions? We've really um, <laughs> extended the patience of our of our listeners. I hope that we we haven't lost too many people. 
Um, with our excitement for CI. <laughs> we haven't actually. Um, it looks like we don't have any questions. Um, That's great. Just positive feedback. So um, people oh, really sweet. enjoyed the the conversation in the slides. Um, just as a reminder to everyone, it'll be recorded. Uh, so you'll have that to look over again. Um, and if you have any questions, please let us know uh, right now and uh, we'll answer them. In the meantime, I'm gonna switch back and uh, show my screen and finish up. So again, just as a reminder, we have um, our programs coming up. We have Drupal Global Training Days, which is a low cost or free uh, intro to Drupal training. So if you are a training company or a community member that uh, is active in your community and would like to build our leadership and growth of the project, this is something you can get involved in. You can click on the link or you can contact me directly about the program. Um, it's really fantastic. So far, I think we've had over 25 countries participate uh, this year. So we're really looking to make this a global effort and uh, spread the word about Drupal. We also have DrupalCon Amsterdam coming up. Uh, the website link is there. I know the early bird price is ending soon, so it might be something to consider uh, if you find this this topic interesting as well as other topics. Uh, DrupalCon is a really great place, place to network um, as well as to take educational settings and um, educational classes. And it's a great setting to just meet the community and uh, work together. And again, our next webinar is June 24th. Metal Toad is presenting on securing Drupal and the tools to test it. You can also see at the bottom of the screen our webinars, and uh, there are more listed and more to come. So just as a reminder, um, I, you know, our membership, either from an organization or an individual membership, is really what uh, helps us, as well as our supporting partners and tech partners. Um, this is what really funds the project lets us have the ability to give scholarships and grants and to maintain our servers. So if you have any questions, uh, look at the link uh, or send us a note and we'll be happy to answer anything about membership. Um, and you know, you get these really cool badges that you get to put on your site as well. So, hey, can you share your, try to share your screen again? Because uh, I, right now we're still seeing Michelle, so. Oh. <laughs> So I, I noticed you said at the bottom of the screen, I wanted everybody to be able to see the links you were talking about. Good to note. Just one <laughs> second. <laughs> Little technical difficulties. It's not a presentation you unless can, you have some. You can see me reverting my commit. Yeah. Looking yep, up yep. How, to, how to undo it. <laughs> <laughs> um, this, is, uh, this is hopefully better. <laughs> Yes, I can see. Great. It um, here is here's the information on uh, DrupalCon, our global training days, and our webinars. Um, also, if you just go to um, either Drupal.org or uh, associates.drupal.org, you can see this information as well. Um, And here's our information on our uh, organization and individual membership, uh, associations.drupal.org backslash membership. And this is uh, where you can find out on how to become a member. And like I said, this is what helps fund us for more scholarships, grants, and uh, of course, maintaining our servers um, and the project. So uh, I think let's look and see if uh, we have any questions, Michelle and Alan, if that's okay. That's fine with me. Great, hold on one second. Yeah, I know it, it says it's nine your time, it's lunchtime for me, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm also gonna look on Twitter to make sure that we didn't have any questions under the hashtag. Uh, all, I, all I've seen so far is actually somebody uh, showing the showing the picture of, yeah, <laughs> there we go. Yeah. If you that link, <laughs> there you are. <laughs> there you go. Um, yeah. So, no questions. Um, I just want to say thank you to everyone. Thank you to uh, Michelle and Alan. It was a really fantastic uh, presentation. I think everyone really enjoyed it. And um, 
If you have any follow-up questions, I'm sure Michelle and Alan are happy to take those. Um, you can find their information on Twitter earlier in the presentation, um, or please, you know, follow up with me, Lauren at association.drupal.org, and I'm happy to pass along any information uh, on the webinar. Sounds great. Great. Thank you guys so much. Thank you very much. Thanks, Lauren. Thanks, guys. Bye.